Tom Tugna, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely to see you, Roger. For those who don't know, Tom is a member of parliament uh, in the United Kingdom. He's coming to us from London. He is a leading voice on foreign affairs and national security. We're gonna get into all of that. Uh, he served uh, in the British military, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, has a remarkable upbring upbringing, um, uh, speaks about half a dozen languages, uh, and now represents um, a constituency in, in the United Kingdom, in the British Parliament. Um, half a dozen languages, that is not something you would ever get from an elected official in the United States. Does that hurt you or help you when you run for office, Tom? Well, I think it's definitely a hindrance because you can be insulted in many more languages than most of your colleagues. So, <laughs> um, but I hope I hope it is I hope it's helpful. Um, certainly, in my current job, it's a bit more helpful. And, and you, of course, uh, uh, studied uh, I think Arabic, maybe in graduate school, perhaps before as well. Uh, did you employ uh, that either in Iraq or any other languages when you were in Afghanistan? Yeah, I did. So I, I learned uh, Arabic in Yemen, uh, in fact, in the same school as a, a rather well-known uh, U.S. alumnus, uh, John Walker Lind. I don't know if you're aware of his work. <laughs> no. um, and um, we, weren't, we, we weren't quite in the same class. Um, and um, he, sorry, and, and so I studied there. Then I went to do my master's in Islamic studies at Cambridge and um, used, I mean, used is not quite the right word, but the, but the knowledge of Islam um, was incredibly uh, important for my service in Iraq and Afghanistan, particularly in Afghanistan. Were you always um, uh, kind of planning to uh, join the military and serve? No, I, I kind of, I mean, I kind of joined by accident, if I'm honest. I, um, I did what quite a few people do in their mid-20s. I got bored with what I was doing. Um, I was working for Bloomberg News. I'd been a management consultant. I'd been a journalist in Beirut. And I got bored with, uh, with, with Bloomberg News. And so I joined the Army Reserve, basically thinking I'd have a you know, couple of adventurous weekends and maybe go and do some sort of UN operation in Congo at some point. Um, and then 9-11 happened. And uh, as I told Mike Bloomberg the other day, I was saved. Saved by 9-11. That's an odd formulation, Tom. Saved from Bloomberg by uh, by being uh, sent into uh, Iraq and saved from uh, saved from uh, the, the the life I was on uh, and uh, had an extraordinary uh, opportunity to serve my country in a very very different way and th and I thought that was for me um, you know 9/11 was an appalling moment for everybody it was a complete disaster and tragedy for our listeners and viewers um, we of course uh, remember it was the 20th anniversary the attacks on 9-11 recently. Uh, what did it mean for those in, in England? It's worth remembering that 9-11 wasn't just a major attack on the United States. It's the single biggest loss of British lives in a single incident. You know, many, many of your viewers will know that the UK has been dealing with IRA violence or mm -hmm. at that point has been dealing with IRA violence for about 30 years. But the, 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 the Twin Towers had some 200, hundred and something UK citizens in them. And amongst the thousands of people who were killed, uh, there was a huge number of UK citizens. And, you know, so it was a, it was the most extraordinary shock. I mean, you know, fundamental shock to all of us. I don't think, you know, if you're British, Amer America isn't really that foreign, if you see what I mean. I mean, you know, yeah. we've grown up watching New York on, you know, I mean, depending on how old you are, um, you know, Friends or, you know, Cagney and Lacey or whatever. I mean, you know. You just got old. You had me at Friends. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to reach back to it. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid I, I, all I can say is their names. I don't, I don't know anything about, <laughs> else about them. But, the, but you know what I mean? The, um, you know, New York is, is, is something that we've all grown up with because it's part of our culture, because it's part of our life. And even for people who haven't been it's, you know, it's very, very familiar. So the attack on 9-11 was in many ways an attack on, you know, many people felt it very personally in the United Kingdom as well. Tom, let's just go back. You're, you're in um, the British Army, so the Reserve, 9-11 happens. Did you know at that moment uh, that you'd be uh, serving or, or 
engaging in the, in the war to follow? Was it kind of intuitive to you, expected that uh, NATO would uh, you know, use Article 5, trigger Article 5, and come to the common defense? No, I, I mean, I, I think like most people, I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect next. I mean, I, I, think, I think we all expected some form of a military response, and within a few days, it was pretty clear that that would include, uh, obviously, Al-Qaeda and something in Afghanistan. But uh, it was many years before, or many months, sorry, before it was obvious it was going to be um, uh, Iraq as well. I don't think any of us expected that on, you know, whatever, sure. 11 or 15, 9, 15, whatever. You know what I mean? It, it, it took a while before that before that happened. And, you know, I didn't expect... I mean, I didn't expect my career to take that direction, but I spoke Arabic. And so when uh, the planning for the Iraq war began, um, I presume it's happened way before I heard about it. But anyway, by the time by the time I got mobilized for war in uh, in the end of 2002, um, you know, the Arabic and the, the Islamic studies became you know, important. Um, l- let's talk about the tragic bookends of, of this story. Um, your military career, of course, is shaped by Afghanistan and Iraq. 9-11, of course, is what, what drove all of it. And here we are uh, uh, 20 years later, and we have this uh, real tragedy taking place in Kabul. The Taliban uh, had uh, essentially controlled the seat of government, took over, and, um, of course, the United States and all Western forces uh, exit. Um, you... We're angry, raging about this, and um, about a month ago, uh, you ad- offered an address to Parliament where not only did those members of Parliament stay quiet, which is somewhat unusual, I think, based on when I watched the Parliament, uh, but the whole it seemed like country and you know the world listened to what you said. Uh, for our listeners and viewers, take us back to August 18th and what was a message you were delivering to your colleagues in Parliament, and it seemed like you weren't only speaking to them, you were also speaking to the United States. I think I, I think it's worth starting off by saying uh, one of the greatest privileges of my life has been serving alongside U.S. troops in action. I mean, you know, they're an extraordinary bunch of individuals. I mean, you know, quite remarkable um, in energy, drive, integrity, um, you know, in everything and you know, the serving alongside Americans has been always a great pleasure and so you know for somebody frankly as pro-American as I am um, to see what was happening unnecessarily in Afghanistan to see the chaos and the, and, and, and the fear and, and the pain that we caused in that in that departure, it, it was really hurtful, and it and it was hurtful because, you know, to me, to anybody who served in Afghanistan, the people who were there weren't really foreigners in the sense that they weren't, you know, they weren't people we didn't know, we'd never heard of, we'd seen them down the end of the screen. No, they were people we'd lived with. Sometimes we'd fought alongside. Sometimes, you know, had been our interpreters. Sometimes had been fellow soldiers. Sometimes they'd been local government officials or teachers that we'd supported. You know, the fabric of life, if you see what I mean. The, the, you know, the the ordinary folk you live with. And for many of us, I mean, many Americans spent 12, 15 month tours. Uh, I spent four years in Afghanistan, uh, on and off. I mean, pretty much four years. And you know, it's. It was really, it was really painful to watch those scenes and and to be getting phone calls from friends saying help, um, and to feel that it was just so unnecessary. So, you know, what I wanted to say to my colleagues, and I, I wrote a speech that was rather calmer than and easier than the one I gave. But as, as I heard the debate going on, and just felt that. The House wasn't listening. It hadn't realized, if you see what I mean. People hadn't realized the debate was sterile. And, you know, I don't blame anybody for that. They hadn't lived it. Of course they hadn't. So, but it was, it was a relatively sterile debate. And I, I remember holding the speech I'd written and 
giving a totally different one because I was so cross. Um, and it was, it was just one of those moments. There was no emotional element to it. People weren't, didn't realize, didn't kind of carry the 20 years of the commitment and the investment and the relationships. Well, it's, and you know, I mean, my investment has been minor compared to many. I mean, I spent four years there and I, you know, came out uninjured and fine. I mean, I can, I can show you men and women I served with who are very, very badly injured, either mentally or physically, or indeed both, and others who've given everything. And, and so, you know, it's not, you know, my sacrifice has been like remarkably little when you when you look at how much some have given and so i i have to say i, I that's that's what made me so well i mean you listen to the speech and we'll link to it uh everybody should should listen or watch it you said i have watched good men go into the earth taking with them a part of me and a part of all of us and then the, the events you say of the, at the time this is in august has torn open some of those wounds has left them raw and left us all hurting and you expanded this, not just soldiers, but it's, it's the aid workers, it's the diplomats, it's the same. Um, you still feeling that way, Tom? Yes. I mean, I mean, you know, you can calm down and you can, you can put things in context. But, you know, I, I won't tell you where and I won't tell you how, but there's a guy I used to work with who I've managed to get to one of the borders. Um, through a sort of almost an underground railroad of, of sort of safe houses of people we, you know, I and other ex-servicemen know, some American, some British, and we're moving, we're trying to help get people out. And you get somebody up at the border and then it turns out that for a reason of bureaucracy, they don't have the right paper, they don't have the right whatever. And, you know, and it, it comes flashing back very, very quickly. And, you know, that's not to... That's not to, to, to negate the amount of effort that many governments are putting in, and certainly, you know, right. I mean, you know people are trying, but it, it, it's intensely frustrating. And we, you know, most importantly, Roger, I think the, the key point is this didn't need to happen. Didn't have to happen. Uh, it, it, you, you said that. It's, it's, it's unnecessary. I want to come back to that in just a moment, but, but before we do, the critique of the United States seems to be at two levels. One is what you've just said, which we'll get to, it was the decision to leave you deemed unnecessary. But second, you call out the commander in chief, President Joe Biden, uh, for because he called into question, this is, these are your words, the courage of men I fought with. To claim that they ran is shameful. And then you say, those who have never fought for the colors they fly should be careful about criticizing those who have. And I'll note that's, that's the one time your fellow MPs kind of clapped or hear here it was just the British equivalent I guess of clapping but tell us about that why was that the piece that was that needed in your mind uh, to be called out it, it I you know I, I I there is no question in my mind that civilian oversight of the military is a fundamental protection of democracy in our in our you know in our in our countries and you know I don't question that at all but be really careful when you accuse somebody of cowardice, particularly if you don't know what it takes to fight. And the reason I say that is because, you know, I know these Afghans who he's, who he said ran, and, and many of them died in battles alongside us. They died on uh, a tenth of the pay, not even a tenth of the equipment that we had. They had no guarantee that their families were safe. They couldn't be certain that pensions would be paid and now they won't be. You know, these are people who, if you look at the terms and conditions of employment, no congressman or senator would allow a single US serviceman to fight in those conditions. And all the while knowing that the adversary, the enemy, was going to remain there and they would never, these are not an adversary that was comply with the Geneva Conventions. No, <laughs> and, and, but this is, but look, you know, and by the time this, these comments were being made about the fall of Afghanistan, you know, let's not forget what happened at the beginning of July when the United States withdrew troops from Bagram. Okay, it closed Bagram Air Base. I mean, that, 
decision of dubious military merit, but it, you know, it did that. The second thing it did that is often ignored is the thousands of contractors who are maintaining the helicopters that kept the Afghan forces supplied, armed and fed disappeared. And with them went the helicopters. And so suddenly you found Afghan positions way out in the West, Herat, down in Lashkagar, wherever they were, unable to be resupplied. And the extraordinary thing to me is not how many at that point made some form of a tactical deal and saved their hides, but how many of them fought? I mean, you know, there's a unit that I served alongside that managed to extract itself from a desert fort to the air base in Kandahar, which had by that point been abandoned. And they fought to the last man. Now- it, it, This unit fought to the last man? They were all killed. You know, that's, you know, that's pretty remarkable because if you, you know, they didn't seek to compromise. They didn't seek to, they didn't seek to run. They did not and, run. And then, you know, but nobody else can talk for them and they can't talk for themselves. So, you know, the point about elective office is not to speak for yourself, but to speak for those who need a voice. And well, you, you certainly gave voice uh, to those who served in Afghanistan, those who understood the Afghans. Uh, we're going to have to talk about that mug at some point uh, when we get on a, a, to a lighter moment. Um, but let's stay on the second critique, which is embedded in the, in the rest of your remarks, which is, in your mind, it was an unnecessary decision by the United States to pull out. Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, his administration would say, it was inevitable. We have to do this. We might as well just you know, rip the Band-Aid off because it was not sustainable. Uh, and you take that argument on. Tell us, explain to us your response uh, to the Biden administration view that it was inevitable that this government would fall, that, that the Taliban was going to take over. Well, it, it, you know, it was certainly inevitable that if you pull the rug from under them, they're going to fall over. I mean, that, that's inevitable. <laughs> what is not inevitable is that the United States so desperately needs to re redeploy two and a half thousand soldiers, about half the complement of an aircraft carrier, less than 10% of the number of troops in South Korea. You know, it wasn't inevitable that that had to happen. Now, I understand that the Biden team, you know, had a, you know, have a very valid point in that they want to focus on China, they want to focus on the technology uh, advances that we need to make, and they don't want a distraction. I get that. I mean, I, I really do get that. And I think those are reasonable strategic decisions that the, 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 the team made. I also think it's entirely valid for them to point to uh, the instrument of surrender that was signed by the Trump administration in November, which was effectively... The instrument of surrender, of course, was the, the deal, uh, the document signed by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo with the Taliban, uh, where there was an agreement for U.S. withdrawal, provided uh, the Taliban met certain uh, requirements, of course. There was no Where's attempt. I mean, there wasn't really. I mean, the, the Taliban kept saying that they're not going to meet the requirements, and it was signed right. anyway. So there, the Taliban was in breach, but the Biden administration felt bound to it, to your, to your point. Yeah, and and I don't think I mean I don't think anybody I mean literally nobody believed that uh, the Taliban were ever going to be anything other than in breach, and they never even made any pretense to try to do it. You know, they they never pretended to live up to it. And before then, of course, the Obama administration set a deadline at the time of the surge, uh, which effectively changed the dynamics in Afghanistan, which meant that people had to start thinking of a non, you know, a non NATO future, a non American future. And so the three the three incidents there. I mean, I'm not, you know build up one to the other, the Obama deadline, the Trump surrender, and then the Biden withdrawal. All of them, of course, you know, they come as part of a pattern. But, you know, you still get to July 2021, and you don't have to withdraw at that point. You can look at the commitment that you're making, and you can, you can decide that, look, you call it a forever war if you like, um, but do you call South Korea a forever war? So th this is the key point. It, it, it's in your, your speech, and I've heard you expand upon it elsewhere. I take your argument that if you would have sustained the true presence, even at 2,500, this economy of force, we could have held off the Taliban. 
we could have given support to an imperfect but yet friendly government in Kabul. And that would have been enough to take care of our counterterrorism needs and provide, you know, the improved conditions, certainly prevent the Taliban from, from uh, the radicalism and the fundamentalism that now will, will, will cover Kabul and all of Afghanistan. Um, the Biden administration would say, no, what you would have done is carried on a civil war and endangered U.S. forces. The Taliban would have attacked kind of make them a 10-foot adversary here. What's your response to that? Well, look, I mean, U.S. troops have been out of major combat operations since 2014. Um, so, you know, the last you, you British soldiers killed in action, sadly, were killed in December 2013. The last American one's about 18 months ago. But that belies the fact that actually the serious combat operations in which we were losing very, very high troop numbers, were broadly speaking over by 2014. Now, you know, I'm, please don't think for a second that I think any of the deaths that we see, seen, saw since then are, you know, acceptable. That's not the point I'm making, but they're not. And each of them's, a, you know, each of them's tragic. But the, the U.S. forces were not engaged in significant combat operations since 2014. It was well, you're essentially saying the, the war was over. We were not in, a, in active hostilities. It was, a, it was a, a place that was not safe. There were still, you know, you had to be very careful where you went, but we were, in, were not engaged in combat operations like we were, when you say 2014, certainly through you know, after 2016. Yeah. No, it was, it was, in that sense, it was over. And what we were doing was we were supporting Afghan forces, Afghan elements, and, you know, the helicopters element is one, uh, but actually the logistics train, uh, the, the training that the UK forces did, you know, and you're right. I mean, it, you know, <laughs> it wasn't Switzerland. I mean, I get that. It wasn't Switzerland, but it was, it was seven years after the end of really vicious, Civil war. Just, but just give us your assessment of the Taliban. Certainly, uh, they have been planning for some time for this offensive uh, to retake Kabul whenever the U.S. would be out. Do you agree with the Biden administration assessment that not pulling out would have invited a Taliban offensive against U.S. installations, U.S. forces, U.S. contractors, and then there would have been a ratcheting up of hostilities in a way that we hadn't seen in years. I mean, that's the contention of the Biden administration. So I have no doubt that the, that the Taliban would have tried that. But given that US forces were basically in two uh, central locations, Bagram Air Base and Kandahar Air Base, which, you know, when I was there were mortared on a pretty regular basis, but largely ineffectively, um, not entirely sadly, but largely, um, right. you know, <laughs> It's true they would have been targets, but you know, US forces are, I'm afraid, you know, they're there like British forces. You know, the, the point of wearing the Queen's uniform is to pursue the foreign policy and the interests of the British people. It's it's not, and I wish it were, but it's not to just stay safe at home. To stay safe at home is to be a police officer, well, you know, or to be a civilian or to be a right. you know. To, to do something else. I mean, being a police officer is pretty dangerous, actually. But you, you know what I mean? It's, it, that's not the same purpose. So, the, so, so, th this is where you come in with this language of this is not a forever war. This is kind of like forever peace, that it's uh, at times a hot peace. Explain what, by, what you mean by that, because you're obviously arguing that we should be there, continue to be there for a sustained period of time, and it's worth the effort. Um, and, you know, this is where the Korea example comes in. So, so explain that. Well, look, I mean, Policing in the United States and in, in the UK is, is a dangerous job, and you know, we, we know that, but you don't describe ordinary policing as a forever riot. You describe it as policing, and you maintain you know, framework patrol. I mean, you know, police officers around the world, and certainly in our countries, do this with enormous courage uh, every day. They're not constantly you know, in a riot just because they're on a police patrol. They're actually keeping people safe by presence, by intelligence, by engagement. And yes, it's dangerous, but it's, but it's important. It's really important work and we all know it. And if you look at somewhere like South Korea or Germany or 
you know, if you look at South Korea 20 years after the Korean War, you know, most people would have said it's a basket case. It was a military dictatorship in the South. It was largely what it is still, sadly, in the North, which is a vicious communist dictatorship. And it, you know, it had huge problems of corruption. It had huge problems of uh, economic um, plight. I mean, it just, I mean, it was, a, it was a very broken economy. But look at it today, you know, 50 right. years later. South Korea is one of the pillars of the democratic world. It exports not just machine goods, but culture, art, science. I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal success. Phenomenal. With tens of thousands of U.S. forces on the ground. With still 30,000 still. U.S. forces. You know, and, but they're not in a forever war. They're in a forever peace. And, and they're maintaining that peace that keeps us all safe and prosperous. And, you know, which... Maintaining the peace through, through strength is where I thought you were going to land there to... Uh... Well, my mug there to quote uh, President President Reagan. Um, strength is true. I mean, you know, say this pacem para bellum. There we go. Another language being spoken by the multilingual. Well, that's, you know, that's, I, I can't remember who it is now. It's probably it's probably been ascribed to many Roman authors. But it's uh, if you aim for peace, prepare for war. And yeah. it's, you know, you know, making sure that you are. You know, making sure you are able to defend yourself and you are prepared to defend yourself is one of the ways that you persuade people that they shouldn't attack you and that they should deal with you as as a as a fair equal. Well, let's talk about persuading people because you are a Tory MP. Uh, Boris Johnson, of course, is the Prime Minister, and it's not entirely clear to me, uh, Tom, where you sit vis-a-vis -vis your party, where your party sits vis-a-vis -vis this decision in Afghanistan. Uh, Kind of demystify for us where where the Tories are on Afghanistan, the best that you can tell, and then when you talk to your constituents, where the British people are, um, are you getting out of boy for what you said on August eighteenth, or do people look at you like that's kind of his oddity of being a, a former, you know, formerly ha having served in Afghanistan, but uh, they're not internalizing this. What's your what's your take of where the people are in in, in the UK and uh, where the Conservatives are. So I've, I've had a I've had an awful lot of support over uh, over those comments. I mean, I must say, people have been exceptionally kind to me um, about it. And the the reality is, it's you know, in one sense, of course, people aren't obsessed with Afghanistan in in the average British population. Of course, they're not. Um, you know, people have many other pressing issues in their lives that matter very much, and it's it would be. It would be odd if people were constantly obsessed with a, you know, with a foreign country. But one thing that does interest British people, and I think Americans too, is we don't like being defeated. And you know, as I said, in, you know, this doesn't have to be defeat, but at the moment it looks like it. Now it doesn't have to be defeat because there's plenty of things we can do to make sure that it isn't. But well, we're not going to be there. I mean, in terms of th this is the Taliban's, are, I mean, it's, it's defeat of a government yeah. that we supported. I don't know how you get around that. We invited defeat by withdrawing. I mean, well, I think I've heard you say the same. No, no, indeed, that is a defeat. But what I mean is it doesn't have to be defeat for the United States or for the United Kingdom. If we invest in alliances, if we actually uh, remember that we, you know, have a responsibility around the world and we need to, and we need to stand up with each other. And I think you know, that's the that's where we really need to engage now. And at the moment, we're not. Let me let me ask you about that because uh, when President Biden was elected, he used the language "America's back," and what he meant by that is back as a dependable ally, as an engaged member in the community of nations, and not this kind of Trump Trumpism, you know, approach to you know, the swagger and go it alone. Uh, do you think the the UK views as America is back after what happened in Afghanistan. Can, can both be true? Can we withdraw from Afghanistan without really coordinating with allies and at the same time claim that we're back? The lack of coordination really hurts. I mean, I'm not saying it was a total surprise. Of course it wasn't. As I've said, it's been sort of signposted since right. President Obama. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a shock. But it's, you know, this is a, this is an operation we went into together. Um, you know, we have fought literally side by side. Um, it was a bit of a, you know, it was a bit of a blow. If America really is back, and I hope very much that she is, then 
you know, investment in NATO, investment in uh, the South Pacific, as South China Seas, you know, that's what we all need to see, not just for the UK, by the way, but for, for all America's allies. Um, it is interesting, actually, talking to Japanese or Lithuanian or German or Australian. That raised a lot of questions amongst many people, and it was noticeable that within days of the withdrawal, so, so uh, ironically, those who want to focus on China felt that the Afghanistan was a distraction, but the manner in which we handle Afghanistan policy, actually, I hear you saying, hurt us vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our China policy because we're not viewed as having, what I've heard you talk about, the patience, the commitment, the willingness to work uh, because these, these hard foreign policy and national security challenges require that patience and, and, and stick to itiveness. Well, I mean, don't, don't believe me, believe the Chinese Communist Party. Within 24 hours, they were putting out newspaper articles, effectively advertising to the Taiwanese or trying to persuade the Taiwanese. Yes, that the propaganda machine wasted no time out of, uh, yeah, uh, out of Beijing. But, you know, I even heard, heard you uh, suggest somehow that we'll have to do this without the United States. Did you, that, was that yeah, in the heat of the moment? Said. But I heard yeah, you say right. that we have to think about how we're going to do these things with others if we can't depend on on our ally across the pond? You're 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 going further than what I actually said. I said we we need to think about uh, we need to think about how we work with others in order to make sure that uh, these sort of things don't happen. And the reason the reason I said that is not because I think that you know, I mean, the United States is the irreplaceable ally. I mean, there's no real doubt about that. But. In an operation like this, does the United States really have to be 80%? Shouldn't it be 40? Shouldn't the rest of us be making up 60? Now, that, does that mean that we could do it totally without the United States? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but we should be, you know, we shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't be leaving the United States so that it is solely responsible for operations that matter to all of us. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, we've obviously been uh, dealing with the issue of the day, but um, you also... Um, focus in your position as chair of foreign affairs committee and just being a foreign policy and national security expert a lot on China. You're the leading voice as far as we see it here in the United States in the British Parliament on the China competition, challenge, threat, however you want to characterize it, on every plane. Um, do you feel that on the China side of the House, um, the Biden administration gets it and um, they know what they need to do and are taking it seriously enough? Yes, I do, actually. I think that's one of the really interesting things that a lot of British people, a lot of other non-Americans didn't understand is quite how bipartisan the approach to China is. I, I think I'm right in saying it's probably the only policy on which Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump agreed. Um, and it was, um, and, you know, the way that the Biden administration has come in um, working with the Quad, working with us, working with others to make sure that uh, China policy is much more aligned, um, but without in any way diminishing um, the intensity, I, I think is very good and, and extremely important for all of us because we are in a, you know, we're in a generational challenge and the difference between the generational challenge that your, uh, the, the institute you're, you're, you're named after and the current one is, um, is not to diminish the achievement of winning the Cold War, but you know the Soviets didn't have, didn't own you know technology companies in the West. They didn't have thousands of graduates at universities. They weren't producing software and technology that everyone. And it wasn't buy. wasn't the robust economy that uh, you know number no. two seemed to be number one economy in the world. No, absolutely. Um, well, maybe we'll have you back on since we're running out of time to to, to delve more deeply into. Uh, what you're doing more broadly on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the British Parliament and, and specifically uh, the great work you're doing on China and, and how, once again, the West needs to come together and, and, and democracies around the world uh, need to come together. But before we let you go, uh, on this podcast, we always have our Reagan lightning round. Uh, Tom, you and I uh, spent some time together a few years ago in London. You seem to be able to quote Reagan chapter or verse almost as quickly as you go to, to Latin. Um, give me your favorite Reagan speech, quote, book, any or all, whatever, what do you got for us? 
<laughs> my 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 favorite is is I'm afraid is it, it, it's a, a really it's a really basic political one, which is you got to dance with the one that brung you, <laughs> which is just it's the essence of politics. It's you are elected to represent people. You are not elected to follow your own sort of you know grandiose plans. So you you got to dance with the one who brung you. Is that constant reminder that you got to serve the people who elected you. That is your people. job. The people. That's it, right? So that's one of my favorites because it's it's really important for a politician. Well, we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, Tom Tuganot, Member of Parliament, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to speak with us today. We want to have you back uh, to cover a variety of other things you are leading on in the British Parliament. Well, look, Roger, it's, it's lovely to see you. Thanks for having me on. I'll come back anytime you like.